Hallelujah. Ran out of that grave. Amen. Did you run out of that grave? Yes. Hallelujah. We've been talking about righteousness. We've been talking about righteousness. It's who I am. Say it with me. Righteousness, righteousness. is who I am. You know, we talked about in Luke chapter 22, where, he, where Jesus talked about in the last days, he goes, he goes, make sure you're awake and make sure you're alert because so you can be counted worthy, you can be counted worthy and you can stand in the presence of the Son of Man. So Jesus was saying, you need to wake up and you need to be ready because you need to be able to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. And as we've discovered, the only thing that's going to cause you to stand in the presence of the Son of Man or be counted worthy in the last days is righteousness, right? It's going to be righteousness. In Romans chapter 1, we we talked about this week where it says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, right? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek, for therein is righteousness revealed. So as we look at the gospel, we have to look at it beyond the means of just salvation, but we have to see it as a way and a means that, hey, therein is righteousness. It's the whole aspect of the gospel was to cause not just you and I to go to heaven, but cause us to be righteous say righteous in in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 it talks about that if we're in Christ Jesus it said all things are passed away all things are passed away I I, I played that song you know it's one of the songs I run to and I listen to that song I run about uh, you know I think I think I run about you know my mile uh, about a minute faster when I listen that song when I run but 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 thinking about we came out of that grave But so often, even though you may have come out of the grave, you're still consumed with your past. Old things have passed away. So here, what is he saying? He said, step out of old things and step in and receive the new things. Think, step out of old things. But too often, even though we may be born again, yet we're still wearing the old things. We, we still have who we used to be. We still, we still like to, to talk about the old things. We, we still like to reminisce about the good old days. And, and I'm all for testimony. I'm all for, 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 for remembering where God's brought you. But too often people live there. But he says, says old things have passed away. When are you going to let the old things die? When are you going to let the old you die? Because we like to, we, we like to teeter-totter across the fence. We, we like to, yes, I'm the righteous of God, but I still have these issues. I still have this. I still battle this. When are you going to fully step over and become what God's created you to be? You know, in, in, uh, if you keep reading, he says, He who knew no sin became sin, that we would be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin so I could become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. I became righteous in Christ Jesus. Now now get this for a moment. He became something that he wasn't so we could become something we weren't. Let me say that again. Jesus became something he wasn't so we could be something we weren't. He became sin so we could become righteous. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. He who knew no sin became sin that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verse 1. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is... That they might be saved. Man, this is, man this, is, this is Paul's prayer. This is his desire. This is his passion that they would be saved. The word saved there is soteria. It means complete in every way. Verse 2, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now get this. See, it's God's desire that all men to be saved. And so Paul's saying, hey, they have a zeal, meaning they have a desire, but yet it's not according to knowledge. Meaning they're not thinking correctly. 
And I guarantee there's a majority of the body of Christ isn't thinking correctly today. They rejoice in their salvation. They rejoice that they're going to heaven. But have they allowed the salvation to put away the old man? See, too often we can buy into even the lie that, that well, well, it's okay to sin every once in a while. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know, well, everyone, everyone sins all the time. It's okay. You know, we have grace and we've been forgiven. I, I understand that and I get that. But the thing is, is God wants you to come out of that. He doesn't want sin to continue to be a crutch in your life. He wants you to come out of sin. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. He, 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 righteousness not, is not provided. Grace is not provided so we continue to be like the world. Grace is provided so you could be like Christ. But too often religion has twisted it. And, and some grace t- teaching has twisted it. So how should we be operating in this grace and this righteousness? Because here it says when you don't have correct knowledge, he says that you'll be ignorant of the righteousness of God. They didn't have a knowledge of the righteousness of God. And going about and establishing their own righteousness. You see, when you don't know God's true righteousness, you'll try to do whatever you can to make yourself feel righteous. You know, some people come to church to make themselves feel righteous. Coming to church doesn't make you righteous. It's just something righteous people do. You know, maybe, if, maybe if I just had the right car, if I just had the right house, if I just had the right Bible, if I cut my hair just like Gloria Copeland, then if I, just, if I did things, just if I dressed just like this person, I just dressed like that person, then, then, you know, then I'm, I'm going to be arriving. I'm going to be righteous. And, or maybe if I just have the right suit on. And so therefore, what happens is what we try to do is we try to establish our own righteousness to make our, us feel good about ourselves. Well, we, well I, I at least, you know, I, I at least um, wore my suit today. I, I wore my best, God. <laughs> well, I, well, I at least showed up to church. I'm, I'm glad you're here, but being here doesn't make you righteous. It's where you learn how to walk out your righteousness. And, 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 but you'd be surprised how many people, well, if I just do that, then you know what? I'll be righteous. But righteousness has nothing to do with what you do. Righteousness has everything to do with who you are. And when you understand who you are, it will change what you do. An issue that most people have is they just don't know who they are yet. Put away the old man. All things have passed away. Why? Behold, all things have become new. What, what is righteousness? Righteousness. If you look up in the Greek, it gives you a figure of, uh, uh, like a picture of what, this, what the Greek word for righteousness means. And it means this, just as you ought to be. So he who knew no sin became sin so you could be just what you ought to be. What, just what you ought to be. When you made Jesus the Lord of your life and you welcomed his righteousness, he made you just what you ought to be. And, and instead, we get two Build up on what am I supposed to do instead of worrying about who am I supposed to be. And I guarantee when you understand who you're supposed to be, everything else falls into place. Your doing will line up with your being. It's not about what you do makes you righteous. It's not about the clothes you wear. It's not, a, it's not about how much money you have. It's not about your status. It's not about... Anything else but knowing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That in Christ Jesus, I am just what I ought to be. Just what I ought to be. Go to Ephesians chapter uh, chapter 4, I believe it is. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You see, people can be born again, but yet they still have the grave clothes on. Their life is still marked by their past. And yes, they have this heart and this desire to be used by God. They have this heart and desire to 
to be righteous, but yet because they're past, because of different things, they're still looking for righteousness based on their knowledge and not on God's righteousness. This morning, I want us to renew our mind to the righteousness of God because we have to take this off. We have to stop identifying with the old me. Now, I'm not saying that there's not... Tem- yeah, you'll have temptations to be the old you. Yes, you're going you're gonna to be confronted with things, but, but just because you give in, that doesn't mean that you, you just throw in the towel and give... No, pick your... Pick, understand, pick up your understanding of righteousness. In Ephesians chapter 4, I wasn't planning to go here, but... Uh, verse 24, actually verse 23, actually verse 22. (laughs) Hallelujah. Actually, let's look at verse 20. (laughs) I have notes and we'll see if we get to them. (laughs) Ephesians 4 verse 20 says, but you have not so learned Christ. If so, that you've heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. See, your flesh is never going to be righteous. It's flesh. It pretty much just takes on the nature of who's controlling it. It's like a... It's like your your it's like um, your body's like a glove, and it doesn't take a form until a hand's in it. Yeah. Yeah. See, if you take your spirit man and your soul out of this, you would just you would just fall. Why? Because everything is based on on who's leading your soul, whether it's whether it's your mind, your will, and your emotions, or the spirit of man, the the spirit of God on the inside of you. Yeah. <clears throat> that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. I've got to put this off. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Thank you, Father. And that you put on the new man, which after God, after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So I'm to put off the old man. I've I've got to put this off. Well, 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 Pastor, yeah, I'm I'm born again. You, You got to put this off. You got to stop allowing the cravings of this to dictate your life. You have to stop allowing the 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 fear. You have to stop allowing offense. You have to stop allowing these things to keep you as the old man because everything that God has established for you and has done through Jesus was so you could put on a new man. What it says this new man is what? It says it's renewed and it says what does it say? It says that it's created This new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. But the issue that we deal with most of the time is sin consciousness. Let's look at Hebrews. Hebrews. Good works are great. Excellent conduct is great, but they don't make you righteous. If they could, we would have never needed Jesus. Uh, before we read that, let me ask a question. Have you ever been at a place where, in your walk with God, where you were, you know, you would go in and out of making mistakes and, and doing things, and you would wake up and say, okay, today I'm not going to sin. You know what? Today I'm not going to sin. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Only me and a few others in the back row. Okay, I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to sin today. I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to sin today. Or okay, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to look in that direction because I don't want to fall into lust. I'm not going to. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to. And yeah, we need to be cautious about the things we watch. But but the thing, there's this thing of okay, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to leave the house today, and I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. I, I remember being, a, even though I, I, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home and, and would go to youth camp, and I remember being, you know, 13, 14 years of age, and I remember, you know, every youth camp I'd get saved three or four times. 
You know, I, I mean, because, you know, or, or even if I was too embarrassed to go to the altar, I got saved when, when I left because, you know, I remember a friend of mine, his name was Jason, growing up, and, and we, you know, we, I grew up Church of God, and it, every year they would have this, a uh, couple of videos, one was um, Thief in the Night, remember Thief in the Night movie? Anyone know that? Oh, man, that was scary. That will scare you into hell. I mean, seriously, it was, it was a scary movie back in the 70s, man. And, and then there was um, uh, Heaven's, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, you know, and, 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 and these movies. And we, we would leave the church, and, and we wouldn't go up and get saved because we, we didn't want to be embarrassed. But we, we went home, and, and we were sitting on my back porch, and we were like, man, well, Jesus, we know you're going to come soon, but just wait until... Wait until I'm 28, because then I'll be married, and then I'm having all these ideas. Well, God, you can't come back till then, but, but forgive me, Lord. You know, and, and we live in this constant perpetual cycle of, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, please forgive me. I, I, oh, I just had that thought, For, forgive me, Lord. I, oh, I just thought about that again. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Oh, I, mm, for, forgive me, Lord. And it's like you're trying to sweat grapes of jaw, blood, trying to think that, think of, oh, I, I, I should feel worse about this or something, but... But, uh, but forgive me, Lord. Why? Because there, there's, religion has ingrained into, into people sin consciousness. You, in, instead, of, instead of the whole understanding and the idea of, of okay, I'm not going to leave the house. I'm not going to sin today. Why don't we walk out of the house and say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why, why, why is it everything based on the negative? Why, why do we base everything in, in shortcomings and our failures? Let, let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter... T- uh, actually, look at nine, verse nine, uh, chapter 9, for, verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle not made, made with hands, that is to say, not of this building... Neither a blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience... Now, he didn't say purge your spirit. He said purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, too often we try to serve God with our mind and not with our spirit. You're trying to serve God with your mind and your flesh that's been renewed one way your entire life. Instead of renewing your mind to the word of God. And allowing the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus to rule in your life. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 1 says, For since the law has merely a rude outline, foreshadowing of the good things to come. So here he's saying the law, it's saying it wasn't a bad thing. It's just an outline of the good things to come. Instead of fully expressing those things, it can never, by offering the same sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach the altar. Meaning, the law and the way things were done in the law, there's no way that those things could ever make you permanently perfect. Verse 2, for if it were otherwise, for, for if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not having stopped being offered? Since the worshipers had once and for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. Excuse me. Of sin. Now get this. If you were purged by the blood of Jesus, it's saying that you would be no longer conscious of sin. Man, I wish I knew this 25 years ago. But see, the church has been too busy making everyone conscious of sin instead of conscious of being righteous. Here he says, he says the, the, you know, if it was if the, the blood of bulls or goats, if that could have made you perfect, then there would have been another need for anything. But it's saying that, that they would, you, you're conscious 
would be purified. What does conscience mean? It, it means the root word for the word conscience, and I'll leave it here. The, the root word comfort, conscience in the Greek means to see. It means how you see yourself. Too often we live with a sin consciousness instead of a righteousness consciousness. Now, th now think about it for a moment. You could have this mindset of, well, I guess my children, I, I guess they, they don't talk to me anymore. I deserve it because of what I've done. Well, this is happening in my life right now because I, I, I deserve this. I, des I deserve that because, you know, I'm going through this because I deserve it. God's not, really, God is not answering my prayers because, because after all, you know, how I treated them. And so what happens is we relegate everything as it pertains to our relationship with God based on our works. And why things aren't happening comes down to sin consciousness instead of righteousness consciousness. What is sin consciousness? Sin consciousness is when you identify more with sin than you do with righteousness. It's in your mind you associate yourself more with defeat than you do victory. It's in your mind you associate yourself more with failure than success. It's in your mind you associate yourself more with weakness than you do God's strength. I believe sin consciousness is the reason for every spiritual failure. Let me say it again. I believe sin consciousness is the root cause of every spiritual failure. It will destroy your passion in your life. It will take over your heart from pursuing right things. It will take away your vision and purpose for life. It will give you an inferiority complex. It brings a sense of unworthiness that destroys your faith. It will cause you to try to earn a place with God and earn healing. It will rob you of a peace of mind. It will make your prayer life ineffective. And it will keep you from being what God's called you to be. Sin consciousness. It's where we associate more with our old man than we do putting on the new man that is created doesn't have to become righteous. It's created in righteousness. And I'm just praying this morning that just the, the Holy Spirit is going to be working in all of our hearts because we're all in different places but yet deal with the same things. I believe, you know, it's so true. Dr. Will calls righteousness the key to victory. I, 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 so, I so believe this. The more and more that I've been studying this over the last weeks, that, that this is such a key to our lives. Because people struggle time and time and time again because they've not yet taken off the old man. Yes, they're saved, you're going to heaven, but yet you're tormented because you don't understand who you are. You are righteous. It says that our conscience that no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin, what would that be like? That all of us would come to a place where we'd no longer be conscious of sin. We'd no longer be conscious of, of what our flesh is leading us to do. No longer directed by what someone else has done to us. Think about that. We, we see this from the very beginning in the garden. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Are you getting something out of this this morning? Yes, sir. If you're not, Dr. Savell will be here next week. So, <laughs> no. Sin consciousness has been the very issue from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, we know the, the story, you know, how Adam and Eve had fallen let's look at this in verse 7. Because I don't want to talk about the fall. I want to talk about what happened after the fall. Let's look at this in verse 7. 
in the Amplified it says, Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. See, that's what sin, sin does. It, it causes them to feel sin. The first thing it caused them to feel that they were inadequate. They did, that they were naked, that they were shameful, that they were disgraced, that they weren't good enough. It says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron-like girdles. See, that's sin consciousness, meaning, meaning because I feel ashamed, because I feel naked now, I have to do something to cover myself. And that's what, what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 10. They had a zeal, but not according to knowledge, because they didn't know the knowledge of righteousness. So therefore, they tried to establish their own righteousness. And anytime that, see, because we always want to make ourselves look good in front of people, right? See, there's places that I haven't gone back to because of what I did. <laughs> Unfortunately. Because what? We want to make sure that our covering, that everyone thinks we got it together. We want everyone else to think we're what we ought to be. So therefore, we cover ourselves so people, it looks like we're what we ought to be. But yet, deep down, they were still naked. It didn't change the fact that they were broken inside. It didn't change the fact that they were missing something inside. It didn't change the fact that they, were, they, they, that they had lost the very thing that made them like God. So they try to cover. So, so what does sin consciousness do? The first thing it does, it brings guilt. See, that's what guilt, guilt makes you hide yourself. Cover yourself so you look like nothing's happened and nothing's changed. Verse 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. What does sin consciousness do? It caused you to hide Cause you to hide. You know, anytime I got in trouble when I was young, you know, I didn't want my mom to know. I didn't want mama to find out. Like, because I didn't want mama to think less of me. That, that was the biggest thing when, when I messed up. It was disappointing my parents. And, and really, you know, and that's what the enemy wants, wants us to do. He keeps us in this perpetual life of sin when we're called to be free. So what? We continually feel guilty when we continually try to hide ourselves. Uh, yeah. You know, before I keep reading, think about this. Th this is what the enemy plays on humanity. I, I, I remember... I remember after I got born again and, and God had done some amazing things in my life. He healed my body and, and God was doing some awesome things and, and even was able to the place where I was stepping out. I was praying for people and I was on fire for God. But it was about six months in, I went back to my old man because what? I didn't understand my righteousness. Anytime you go back to old things, it really means you just don't understand your righteousness yet. And, and so I remember, man, God was doing great things, but I went back to some old things, and I remember, I remember going to church, and, and, and I went to church because I, I knew I had to go to church because I had a responsibility, but I didn't want to be there because of the choices I made the night before. I didn't want to be there because I was, one, afraid, afraid someone was going to read my mail. I was afraid someone was going to step out and have a word of knowledge and tell them all the bad things I did last night. You know, I didn't want lightning to come down and strike me from heaven that, you know, it, it, see, religion just has, has created these mindsets that, that God's going to get you, God's going to get you, God's going to get you. No, he got you through Jesus. He just wants you to receive Jesus. The only way that you're going to go to hell is when you, if you reject Jesus and you don't allow his sacrifice to be enough for you. And so here I am, I'm, 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 in the, I'm in the church, but you know what? Where I was sitting on the second row behind my parents, I wasn't on the second row anymore. I was, I was on the seventh row. Because <laughs> I didn't want to look anybody in the face. Why? Because of sin consciousness. I had just messed up. Was it okay that I'd messed up? No. It wasn't okay that I'd messed up. I'm not talking, to, I'm not talking about it's okay to live in sin. I'm not talking about that. 
I'm just talking about to stop having a sin consciousness. And so, so I was in the seventh row. Well, I, I was still making some choices, still making some bad. Next thing I know, I'm on the back row. I'm on the back row. And see, if it's not taken care of, you'll go from the front of the church to the middle of the church to the back of the church and out of the church. And people go to church, well, they just judge me down there. No, the church isn't judging you down here. What's happening is, is your sin consciousness is controlling you. Right. See, it's interesting that all of a sudden you get around people that, 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 that have an idea of God but aren't living for God. That, well, don't judge me. Don't judge me. I'm not judging you. Maybe the Word's judging you. Maybe it's actually the Holy Spirit trying to convict you. The Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit is still a convictor of sin. Convictor isn't condemnation. Convictor is to convince you the direction you're going is not right. So what was going on in me was really the Holy Spirit saying, you need to be here. You need what's happening here. And there's this little check here. But what's happening is, is it was God working in me, righteousness working on me. But you know what? I was uncomfortable. And therefore, because I was uncomfortable, no longer did I feel like I had the ability to pray for someone. Where I would be easy for me to pray someone, now I can't. I'm not worthy enough to pray for someone. See, sin will make you a coward. Sin will make you a coward. Living with a sin consciousness will keep you from stepping out and doing what God's created you to do. Don't, don't let sin make you a coward. Understand your righteousness. Pick up yourself. Pick up yourself out of, out of the, the old man. Pick yourself out of that grave. Pick yourself out and, and, and come to a place, Father. Open my eyes to who I am. Because I don't like living this way. I don't like living continually with this mindset of sin consciousness. So they hid themselves. That's shame. Verse 9. But the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. So sin consciousness will cause you to be guilty. It will cause you to experience shame. It will cause you to have fear. In verse 11. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Now get that. Who told you you were naked? Who told you? Who told you that you are not righteous? Who told you that you were naked? See, the enemy always wants to come to you and tell you what you're not. He wants to tell you who you used to be and, and what you are. So it's the same thing. When, when you live with a sin consciousness, it's constantly, it's you, you constantly saying to yourself, I'm naked. I'm, I, I, I don't have what it takes. Who told you you were naked? Who told you that you weren't enough? Who told you you don't have what it takes? Who told you that you're not enough? Who told you that this isn't going to happen? Who told you that you're not good enough? Who told you? That's sin consciousness. And what did, what did it do with that question? And verse 12 says, And the man said, The woman who you gave to me. See, sin consciousness will cause us to do four things. And then the man, bla man cast blame out after her. Sin consciousness will cause you to live with four primary tendencies. Guilt, shame, fear, and blame. You know, if, you, you, if, if someone comes against you with some, something, and, tell, and say you're at work, and someone comes to you and tells you you did something wrong, what's the first thing that we do in ourselves? What, make excuses? Right? Amen. It's, can we be real, Right? Your, 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 your spouse come to you and say, well, how come you didn't do this, that? Well, I had this, I had that, and I had that. No, the question was, how come that didn't happen? 
So immediately we want to, we want to make an excuse. And, and why? Because sin consciousness has told us that we need to be guilty. We need to be fearful. We need to point the blame. We need to do something else. And the body of Christ, everyone is invaded with these four emotions that stem from you on the inside not feeling like you're enough. Ask, well, how come not, not healed yet? How come that didn't happen? How come this and trying to figure out this or trying to figure out that? You need to understand, first of all, above anything else, that you are righteous. You're righteous. You're righteous. Hallelujah. No longer, no more consciousness of sin. I, I, I want to I get to that place in my life. How about you? No more consciousness of sin. No more consciousness. Wow. Let's keep reading in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Thank you, Father. Verse, verse, three, verse 2 again says, For if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not have been stopped being offered? Since the worshipers has once and for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. But as it is, these sacrifices annually bring a fresh remembrance of sins to be atoned for. Meaning back then, every year, they had to offer sacrifices. So every year when they had to offer it, they now remember how much Adam and Eve messed up, how much they messed up, how much their ancestors messed up. Verse 4, because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take sins away. It could cover sins for a year, but it couldn't take sin away. Verse 5, hence, when he, Christ, entered in the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but instead you made ready a body for me to offer. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no delight. Then I said, behold, here I am coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what's written of me in the volume of the book. When he said just before, you have neither desired nor have you taken delight in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, all of which are offered according to the law. Verse 9, he then went on to say, behold, here I am coming to do your will. Thus he does away with and annuls the first order. Say, say this, he does away with. He did away with the first one. So that he might inaugurate and establish the second. And in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy through the offering made once and for all of the body of Jesus Christ. Wow. You have been made holy by the offering of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, every human priest stands at his altar of service ministering daily. Offering the same sacrifices over and over again, which never are able to strip the sins that, and take them away. Whereas this one Christ, after he had offered a single sacrifice for our sins, for all time sat down at the right hand of God, then to wait until his enemies should be made a footstool beneath his feet. For by a single offering, he has forever and completely cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy. Forever, forever, completely cleansed and perfected. Yes. See, but you know what? How, we don't see ourselves that way. We, are, we see ourselves, well, I'm going to mess up, and I guess I'm good until the next time I mess up. Do you see yourself as holy? Do you see yourself as righteous? Verse 15, and also the Holy Spirit adds his testimony to us. Now get it, he adds his testimony to us. This is the agreement, the covenant, that I will set up and conclude with them after those days, says the Lord, that I will imprint my laws upon their hearts and I will inscribe them on their minds. Verse 17, he then goes on to say, and their sins and their law breaking I will remember no more. Now where there is absolute remission... Forgiveness, cancellation of the penalty of these sins and law breaking, there is no longer any offering made to atone for sin. 
Meaning there's not another offering. There's not another sacrifice. It was completed with Jesus. Now, I know for some, this might be basic. I know for some, it might be, hey, I, yeah, I, I know these things. But you know, a lot of people, they don't. Right. Right. Amen. Verse 19, therefore, brethren, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter in the holies of holies by the blood of Jesus, by this fresh and new living way, which he initiated and dedicated and opened for us through the separating curtain and the veil that is through his flesh, and since we have such a great and a wonderful high priest who rules over the house of God, let us come forward and draw near. Now, with, with the true hearts and unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith, by that leaning of our entire human personality on God and absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. Now, listen, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty conscience and our body cleansed with pure water. That you would be cleansed from a guilty conscience. Wow. No more guilt. No more shame. No more fear. No more sin consciousness. The sacrifice of Jesus was about bringing you to a place where you had no longer a consciousness of sin. But too often religion has talked more about sin than talked about righteousness. You're righteous. You're righteous. Don't wake up and say, oh, I'm not going to sin today. 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 You know what? You're going to sin. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because you're sin conscious. Right. That's saying, I don't want chocolate ice cream. 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 I don't want chocolate ice cream from... Baskin Robbins, chocolate ice cream, chocolate ice cream, you know, uh, or a, a cheeseburger from Fuddruckers with bacon on it, and, and it just, it, oh, just, it's, you see, see how many people are going to leave to go to Fuddruckers now, see, because see, when you meditate on something long enough, it's what you become, so let's meditate more on who we are than what we don't want to do. Now, get, get this, righteousness and grace was never provided for me, to, for me to live in sin. It was provided so I don't have to sin. As long as you have sin consciousness, you'll always be bound. You'll never get out of addiction. You'll never get beyond where you're at. You always live in the same place of defeat if you have sin consciousness. But if you have righteousness consciousness, it brings you to a place of freedom. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Being a weekend where we celebrate the birth of a nation, our independence, freedom. Righteousness is about bringing you to a place of freedom. But you can never be free if you continue to have sin consciousness. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No, say no, no. Condemnation. condemnation. So we, we've seen already that if we're in Christ, we're made righteous. But according to this, it says there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. No condemnation. The word condemn means to not be fit for use. You see, when you're condemned or someone condemns you, Satan condemns you, what is he convincing you that you're no longer fit to be used? You're no longer fit for God's love. You're no longer fit to be used by him. You're no longer fit for his kingdom. You are no longer, you're, not, you're lacking something. There is now, therefore, no condemnation. I Meaning if I'm in Christ Jesus, I'm always fit. When I'm in Christ Jesus, I'm always useful. Now, but we have to get a hold of something here because we still have to deal with something. 
Now guess, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now I've heard different people teach on this, but I'm going to tell you that my revelation of this is if I continue to walk after the flesh, I'm still going to have condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. So if I walk after the flesh, I'm going to have condemnation. Walking after the flesh is the same thing as sin consciousness. You see, if I'm in Christ Jesus, there is therefore no condemnation who walk not after the flesh. But when you continue to give into your flesh because of sin consciousness, it will still put you in a position where you feel that you're not fit and you're not useful. But realize, Jesus isn't condemning you. The Holy Spirit isn't condemning you. The God of this world is condemning you. Satan is condemning you. When you choose to walk after your, after your flesh, it's putting you in a position to you to feel condemned. So what's the answer? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The only way to walk above and beyond sin consciousness is to walk in the spirit. Verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You realize that righteousness has put you in a position to be free. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So what? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You see, if you continue walking after the flesh, you're going you're gonna to do the things in the flesh. You, you, can, you can call yourself Christian, you can call yourself born again all day long, but the thing is you're not going to walk in your righteousness. Why? You're still minding the cravings of this flesh. And as you give in to the cravings of this flesh... You're still, going to be, you're still going to be in a position where you feel condemned, even though God's called you righteous. For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. We have been made righteous, not by what we've done. We've been made righteous by what He's done. And it's impossible to walk out this righteousness apart from the Holy Spirit. Walking in your righteousness is not something that you do in your head. It's not something you do in your flesh. It's not something you do with your body. You do it in the spirit, through the relationship, your reborn spirit down on the inside of you. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. I'm a new creation. Thank you, Father. Sin consciousness will always direct you into areas of bondage. Righteousness will always direct you in areas of freedom. The Holy Spirit will never direct you in positions of bondage. Holy Spirit's always going to direct you in places of freedom. Righteousness, it's who you are. And because you're righteous, you are called to be free. Who walk not after the, the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let's go to 1 Peter. Let me, two more scriptures. I know I'm taking a little bit of time with this. Let me teach for just a moment. Because I believe we're coming up in our thinking. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. First Peter. Chapter 3. Let me take you back to a thought for a moment. How I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God into salvation. For therein is righteousness revealed. The gospel reveals righteousness. Now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ the Messiah himself died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, 
the innocent for the guilty, that he might bring us to God. In his human body, he was put to death, but he was made alive in the spirit. Get that. Jesus, he was put to death. He, he, his human body was put to death, but what he was made alive in the spirit. You ever hear Paul make a statement, I am crucified with Christ? Nevertheless, not I that lives, but it's Christ that lives within me. It's righteousness that lives within me. So here Jesus says that he was, he was crucified in his flesh, but what he was alive in the spirit. See, too often we try to live this Christian life and we try to live righteous apart from the spirit. But the Holy Spirit was given so we could walk in this righteousness. The Holy Spirit wasn't just a, a, a thing that they received on the, Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost where they could speak in tongues. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be just like me. He would not only be with you, but he would be in you. He'd be someone just like myself. Verse 19, in which he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. The souls of those who long before the days of Noah had been disobedient when God patiently waited during the building of the ark in which a few people actually, eight in number, were saved through water. And baptism, which is a figure, does now also save you from inward questionings and fears, not by the removing of the outward body of filth, but providing you with the answer of a good and a clear conscience. So the baptism, Jesus, he went down to the lower parts and he preached the gospel to those that were bound in hell. Amen. And he talks about this, this whole aspect of, uh, of this baptism, that it wasn't so you could be washed on the outside, but it's so your conscience would be cleared. An inward cleanness and peace before God because you're demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he has now entered into heaven and is at the right hand of God with all angels and authorities and powers made subservient to him. Man, I'm so grateful that Jesus went to the cross. I'm so grateful that he went to the cross. I'm so grateful that he died in the flesh, but he, be, but he, but he was alive in the spirit. It's the same thing that you died when you accepted Jesus Christ. You died spiritually. But you know what? You were made alive in the Spirit. Now get this. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 4. So since Christ suffered in the flesh for us and for you, arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose. So this is all about the, the, dealing something with the flesh, right? To suffer rather than to please God. For whosoever has suffered in the flesh is done with intentional sin. Verse 2, so that he can no longer spend the rest of his natural life living by human appetites and desire, but he lives for what God wills. Hallelujah. This is, this is living out your righteousness. It's not what makes you righteous, it's living out your righteousness. Verse 3, for the time that is already past suffice for doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in shameless, insolent wantonness, in lustful desires, drunkenness, reveling, drinking bouts, abominable, lawless idolatries, they are astonished and think it very weird that you do not now run hand in hand with them in the same excess of dispensation and they abuse you. Meaning the world thinks it's weird that you're not like them. <laughs> no, the world doesn't like Christians too often. Because we're not like them. We shouldn't be like them. So righteousness and grace shouldn't be allowed us to keep us like them. They are astonished and they think it's weird that we're not like them. Verse 5, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge and to pass sentence on the living and the dead. Verse 6, for this is why the good news was preached. This is why the good news was preached in their lifetime, even to the dead, that though judged in fleshly bodies as men are, they might live in the spirit as God does. Why was the gospel preached? Righteousness is revealed in the gospel. Why was the gospel preached? So we could live in the spirit like God does. <laughs> See, we too often live out of our head instead of our reborn spirit. See, we renew our mind so we can, so we renew our mind with the word. And really what we're doing is we're shaping our spirit man. And our spirit man is now directing our lives. But too often we're caught in between sin consciousness and righteousness consciousness. I don't want to do this. I do want to do that. I don't want to do this. I want to do that. Why? Because you're still living out of your head. We need to be living out of here. 
living out of the Spirit. Go to Galatians 5, and I'll close with this. Did I tell you to go to Galatians 5 already? No? Okay. Galatians 5. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whoever you are justified, whosoever of you are justified by the, by the law, you're fallen from grace. Why am I bringing this out? He says, he says that you are free. Stand fast in your freedom wherewith Christ has made you free and don't be entangled again to the yoke of bondage. Now the yoke of bondage here isn't sin. The yoke of bondage is the law. So s- stop trying to become righteous by what you're doing. Become righteous. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ made you free. Stand in that freedom. Establish yourself in that righteousness. Establish yourself. Christ, verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whoever you are, you're justified by the law. You're fallen from grace. Meaning, if you're trying to get justified by your works, that's never going to happen. You can only be made righteous by, by understanding you received it with Christ. Verse 5, for we wrestle, for we through spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith with works by love. Verse 11, and I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do we yet suffer persecution? Then if offense of the cross ceased, I would they were even cut off that trouble you. Verse 13, for brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not your liberty for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. This whole aspect of righteousness is not something you do with your head. It's something that you do out of here. And you live out your righteousness out of your reborn spirit. Most of the time we give in to our flesh and give in to the natural because our spirit man is weak. That's why the words encourage us to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. You see, we we can't battle these things in our head. We can't battle the sin consciousness. No, you need to understand that you were made righteous. So you have to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Righteousness is who you are, and you are free. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you that your word empowers us. We thank you that your word strengthens us. We thank you that your word is more than enough. Your word is more than enough. Father, that today as a body we would shake off sin consciousness. We would shake off uh, the the, the tendencies. We'd shake off the the, the things that our flesh is leading us towards. And and Father, that we would pick up this life in the spirit. We'd pick up this life that's that's created in righteousness and true holiness. We we thank you, Father, for moving and manifesting in our lives in in a supernatural way, Father. We thank you that we aren't a church that we aren't a church or a body or an in, or individuals that are defeated. We are a church, Father, full of people that are overcoming. We are a church full of people that are righteous because that's what you call us. And thank you that, Father, we are led by the Spirit and not by our flesh. Just as Jesus was crucified in the in the flesh, but he was alive in the spirit. I thank you, Father. Yes, we are crucified with Christ, but I thank you that we are alive in you. We are alive in Christ, and we live out of that life. We live out of that life in the Spirit. Thank you, Father, for a spiritual awakening in every single one of our lives. A spiritual awakening to put away sin consciousness and pick up righteousness consciousness that we see ourselves as righteous. We see ourselves as holy. We see ourselves as as complete. No more consciousness of sin. No more consciousness of sin. Everyone stand to your feet. No more consciousness of sin. No more consciousness of sin. Hallelujah. No more consciousness of sin. Father, that we would meditate and we would think about this righteousness that you provided through Jesus Christ. 
the answer is always Jesus. Before we close, I'm reminded of a story in the Old Testament, Numbers, I believe it's chapter 21, and the children of Israel were in the wilderness and, and they had done a lot of things wrong in the natural. They had given themselves up over to sexual sins and, and given themselves over to these things. And, 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 and at that time, all these serpents were, were coming and were biting them. You know, people say, well, God created these serpents to, to, to bite them. Well, no, I believe the serpents were always there. I believe what had happened was that, that because, because of this dispensation they were under, what happened, it was protection that had been lifted. Jesus hadn't come yet. And so, so here they are getting bitten by these things, but God speaks to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to take, I want you to take a, a, a bronze statue and and I want you to put a serpent on the top of a bronze a bronze serpent on top of a statue bronze represents judgment and the serpent represents the fall of mankind and he tells Moses and he says everyone that looks at it will be made whole everyone that looks at it we will be healed and it wasn't just okay just glancing at it but but the word used for look there is a steady absorbing gaze Meaning you're so focused and, and your, your intention is, is so on it that you're so moved by it. You know, I, I was reminded even if you've ever been to the Science Center and it tells you to look at these circles. And you, and, and you look at these circles for such a long period of time and then you look away, you still see the circles. And that's the same thing that, I, that I'm understanding here, this steady absorbing gaze, that you've absorbed this gaze so long that no matter if I'm looking away from it, I'm still seeing it. No matter I'm looking away from I'm still seeing it. It's still in my eyes. I, I still see it. And it said as they looked on him with the steady absorbing gaze, everyone would be healed. And in John chapter 3, I believe it's verse 13 or 14, it says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What might be tormenting you this morning? What might be biting you this morning? What might be the thing that's challenging you this morning? What difficulties might you be walking through this morning? The answer is no dis- different. It's looking at Jesus. He is our righteousness. The only way to overcome sin consciousness is to have a steadily absorbing gaze at Jesus. Jesus.